Hey everybody, Charles Hoskinson here. I wanted to make a quick video to talk a little bit about treasury systems. It's our favorite topic, at least in the ETC world right now. Okay, so why should we care and what value do they provide? All right, so in the beginning, there is something simple. So when you think about Bitcoin, it's a simple idea. It's actually not a super complicated system. The hard part was thinking it up and inventing it and building it. But then after it was released, uh, a lot of the core concepts like how the ledger rules work, uh, things like the scripting language, so how transactions work, uh, things like the network stack and consensus, uh, they're not super involved, all things considered. And as a consequence, uh, this system from a maintenance viewpoint doesn't necessarily require an enormous amount of people. In fact, if you had a dedicated team of three to five devs, you would be able to main Bitcoin, maintain Bitcoin in its current state and make sure that it's interoperable, compatible with modern computers, and it just does its thing, okay? And that's because Satoshi designed the system in a fairly simplistic way, and that's a good thing. Simplicity is the ultimate elegance, uh, and it's also a good insulation uh, for security. See, when you go to complexity, complexity is the enemy of security and correctness. People can look at the Bitcoin code and the Bitcoin design, and it's pretty easy to analyze and understand, and there's some elegance there, as I've mentioned, but at the end of the day, it's sufficiently simple that most engineers, after a bit of study, can keep the whole thing in their head. When you start looking at things like the EVM, you look at things like sharding, uh, you start looking at the things like scale, so you move from a replicated uh, to a distributed system, okay? And Bitcoin it is somewhat distributed, but it has problems because the way that, for example, the blockchain is stored is replicated. If you run a full node, you have an exact copy as does everybody else. Okay, uh, so that doesn't scale so well because uh, basically you'll have alpha times n copies of the uh, full node uh, in terms of data. So let's say you have a 30 gigabyte blockchain. Uh, I don't remember how big the Bitcoin blockchain is right now. The, the total amount of storage that you're using is times n full nodes. Not good. That's not how a distributed system works. Replicated systems don't really scale because they're only as weak as their weakest link. Okay, so it's replicated, not distributed. So when you want to go from like complex transactions, you want to shard the ledger and uh, be able to have a big state space and you want to go from replicated to distributed and you want more sophisticated network protocols, you end up having lots and lots and lots of complexity. And that complexity is the enemy of security and it's the enemy of correctness. So correctness is, does it perform the way you thought it was? Is it, uh, is it behaving the way that it was intended? And security is, uh, can I do the things that I'm supposed to be able to do, but unauthorized people can't, okay? Well, here's an example of where this can all go wrong, horribly, horribly wrong. So here's the zero cash white paper. And it was a phenomenal paper for its time written by an all-star team, Ali Van Sassen, Matthew Green, uh, Aaron Tromer. These are like really, really, really solid people. Uh, Ian Myers, Alessandro Chiesa, uh, and you know, Madars uh, Vizra, wonderful academics, very smart, big paper. Lots and lots of pages. Uh, I think the final version is like 54 pages with references. Okay, and this was the opening paper for the Zcash ecosystem. Now, Zcash has a treasury, and very rightfully so. Why? Because the people who constructed Zcash realized that stuff like this is going to happen. Zcash team reveals it fixed a catastrophic coin counterfeiting bug. This is one of the worst bugs in the history of the cryptocurrency space. Why? Uh, because you could counterfeit Zcash tokens, and you could do that without being detected. So uh, not only can you impact the monetary policy of the system, you could do so in a way that other actors would not know that you succeeded. 
The problem is that Zcash is a super complicated system. If you look at the sapling upgrade, for example, uh, this was a huge body of work and a lot of highly professional, extremely skilled domain expert engineers had to wake up every day and figure out how to do that. And the thing about Zcash is this is a Bitcoin-like system. Okay, so they started very wisely with a simplistic set of rules. They used the proof of work system like Bitcoin does, a relatively same network stack with some improvements, similar ledger rules, similar way of doing transactions. And then they added on top to that model, the whole Zcash infrastructure. Despite that, and despite the fact that the team is composed of some of the best academics and engineers in our industry, they still had a major issue. Okay. And what does that major issue mean? It means that if there wasn't a dedicated, well-funded, good team to proactively resolve this and their words, subtle, uh, the subtle bug in a, a, a efficient way, uh, it's a very high probability that it would have been unpatched for an attacker to use. And because of the nature of this bug, an attacker could have used it silently and people wouldn't have even known that Zcash's monetary policy had effectively been destroyed. And so then we ask ourselves the roadmap for Ethereum Classic, ETC. So ETC has to decide what it wants to be as an ecosystem. And this is why I'm bringing up the treasury conversation. It has to decide, does it want to err towards simplicity? Or does it want to go compete with F2 and go for complexity? Vitalik recently uh, was interviewed by Cointelegraph and said, boy, this F2 thing is a lot harder than we thought. And they're trying to push their way towards it. Cardano, for example, we've spent over $100 million in five years chasing the same type of complexity. Uh, and we've had to do a lot to manage that. And I think we're better suited for it. And it's really starting to show with the Shelly release. But despite people's opinions, F2 is, is also chasing that. And we have a treasury system. It has roughly $140 million available for the community and alternative teams and us to use to get to the next level. And we'll have that discussion 2021. We're starting to roll out that treasury system in Cardano. Okay. F2 has a huge economic moat, a lot of well-funded ICO companies that can contribute, consensus can contribute, and the foundation, which has hundreds of millions of dollars of value sitting around, and it can definitely compete to deal with all of that complexity. Now, the core argument for a treasury is that you need some pool of capital and either you get it from an ICO or other people's ICOs or the blockchain makes it for you, like what we're doing with Cardano. If you don't have that, then how are you going to be able to chase this? And also who is going to propose this? And how do we guarantee that that team can get there? So if you're a DAP developer, and you're sitting here and you have more than 500 choices now, 500 choices. And you're sitting and saying, okay, which platform should I use? Should I use Cardano? Should I use F2? Should I use ETC? And you say, all right, well, first off, can I get funding? No, there's nothing really available for you, especially when concerned with these other systems. Okay. Where is this platform going and who's actually going to get it there? There's no current roadmap to deal with emergent complexity. And it's not clear which team is actually going to deliver this. Um, right now, they're maintaining clients and doing kind of shallow hard forks that are following innovations coming from the Ethereum ecosystem, which really aren't going to be portable when F2 moves to proof of stake. The technology is going to be radically different. Okay. So there's not a clear roadmap. It's not clear who's responsible. And so this complexity doesn't seem obtainable within the ETC ecosystem. So there can be a regression to simplicity, for example, but then again, who's going to lead you there? And what is the roadmap to get there? 
it turns out that there's a lot of competitiveness that you could attract by being Bitcoin's testnet. There's a huge amount of value there. Why? Because we can take a look at papers, for example, uh, BitML. And this is something that was built for the Bitcoin space, but it could be very useful for a smart contract system. You have things like Merkle Ice abstract syntax trees. You could switch the signature system to BLS signatures ahead of Bitcoin. And that means you get all kinds of cool new objects that you can work with, cryptographic objects you can work with. You have things like coded Merkle trees, and they're really cool. You have things like UtreeXO, for example. Uh, ErgoScript is a real cool idea out of the Ergo community, and this could be implemented. You have things like uh, Fountain Codes, a secure fountain architecture. This is a team out of Berkeley. If you read their paper, they get 1,000x storage savings and then encode 191 gigabyte Bitcoin blockchain to 191. 195 megabytes on average. It's pretty cool when you think about that. So there's actually a great marketplace to be a simpler system overall and get rid of this EVM bull hooey and not have to shard and still be able to do some things in the distributed space, still be able to have high assurance applications uh, and still offer a unique choice that is distinctly different from F2 or Cardano, or EOS, or Tezos, or any of these other guys. And you know what? That's a roadmap we could follow. But in this debate between simplicity and complexity, there needs to be independent teams to help sort it out. And this is really the first core argument of a treasury, the first core value proposition of it. You need independent, well-funded teams. Because through the ECIP process, those teams are going to have an opinion, a philosophical opinion. Do we want to increase the complexity of the system or do we want to reduce the complexity of the system? And what are the trade-offs here? And ultimately, what are we offering those developers who will create use and utility for the system? It's just that simple. And if you have independent, well-funded teams, you need at least two or three. Okay, to hold each other in check, there's a marketplace of ideas. And what that means is you'll have lots and lots and lots and lots of proposals, some on this side, some on this side. And then inevitably what can happen is they'll merge and then you'll form something on that spectrum of simplicity to complexity. You'll pick a side, you'll pick a location, and then that portfolio of ECIPs is the roadmap then it's very easy when you have a treasury system for marketers to go ahead and ask which stakeholders are interested in this trade-off because the reality is that everybody who has an application they come somewhere on this spectrum and they have some business and technical requirements as well as a set of values when you look at these things this complexity to simplicity these are different value sets so a developer has a business model and they want to make money, but then they also have uh, want to make money within their belief of how things ought to be done. So what a marketer can do is analyze the set of stakeholders who live in that value set, and then they can write a campaign specifically for them and go and execute that campaign. And they can be funded for that out of the treasury system. And there's uh, going to be competitive pressures that exist there. And you know what? Those people here you're offering them funds from the treasury system to go and adopt the platform. So they have the funds that they need to come into the ecosystem and try out our system. So what does it mean? Increases use and utility. See, it's a positive feedback loop. It feeds into itself. People know there is a future. Why? Because the who has been answered. There are three independent teams that are well-resourced and capable of sustainably executing a roadmap and when events come up, like, for example, these types of events, these catastrophic bugs, there's going to be somebody around to fix it. And there's going to be money around for independent security audits and all kinds of things. So it makes a developer feel like the platform that they're building on is solid because these independent teams have a voice and they're not beholden and controlled by a rich benefactor. They are truly independent.
And because they have a voice and they're independent, the ECIP process is working properly and there's checks and balances and real decentralization there. And the community has assurances that they're not getting railroaded or pushed into an uncomfortable thing. And then you can have a big philosophical conversation of complexity versus simplicity. And where should you fall? Should this be a roadmap where you're a few years ahead of Bitcoin and basically taking a path that Bitcoin could take, leapfrogging that, and then developers say, well, I'd love to build on Bitcoin, but I can't build the things I want to build. So I'll build on ETC. It's a nice prototype network. And then whenever Bitcoin's ready, I can be a multi-chain application and work on both systems. That's one thing that simplicity can get you. And transient-wise, probably get hundreds of great developers using utility over the next few years, just satisfying that role. You want to go for complexity, we had to spend over $100 million on the Cardano side chasing that. And there's more to spend, there's more to do. It's a very expensive, very time-consuming, very difficult thing to do. And there's tons of competition there. These are the high performance chains that are looking for billions of users. Uh, they're looking for, uh, you know, a huge set of use and utility and applications. They want to be everything to everyone. And we all have our philosophies of why our chains are going to win, but it's a crowded space. There's a lot of money in it and there's a Titanic war being fought. And there's no way in my view that anybody can be successful unless they have a treasury system an economic moat and either they got it from an ICO or they get it from a treasury, but you need something like that in order to be able to compete in that pool because it's so competitive, it's so vicious, and there's a lot of ideas floating around. And frankly, I don't think ETC is in a good position to do that. We need to go back to first principles as an ecosystem and say, let's build strong independent teams. Let's get those strong independent teams well-funded uh, so that they're able to really think carefully about where the road ahead is. And you know what I can do uh, with my independent team is propose a collection of ideas. And we'll propose a simplicity idea and we'll propose a complexity idea with a trade-off profile and risk reward and, and so forth. And you know what? There'll be checks and balances if there was a treasury system with strong independent teams that are capable of looking at those proposals and saying, no, we don't like them or no, we don't think they're right. Uh, or maybe this is an easier, better way or cheaper or less risky way of doing it. And then through that discussion, eventually we can get to that compromise and be able to find where ETC needs to live. One thing that's not an option is for ETC to live where it's at today. It can't because it's in the worst of both worlds. It's too complicated because the technology of Ethereum is too complicated. It was built as a prototype, an experiment that was always meant to be replaced. It wasn't like Bitcoin, which enjoys the luxury of being a rather simplistic system by design. And as a consequence, it's stable and it can run that way for a long, long time. And it doesn't need a lot of maintenance to do that. This is a situation where people wanted to experiment and they did. And they attracted tons of other people to come in and tens of millions of dollars of capital have been deployed to get to a point where that experiment is soon going to end and be replaced. ET, let me zoom out, uh, ETH1 is dying and ETH2 is coming. And ETH2 is a reflection of all the lessons that Vitalik and his team and the ecosystem as a whole have learned. There's a lot of good lessons there. They were very expensive lessons on the back of DeFi failures, on the back of emerging science and distributed systems, thousands of conferences and conversations with DAP developers and scientists and engineers. There's an enormous amount of collective knowledge and intelligence there. And ETC, because it's not gonna go to proof of stake, really can't follow in that wake. So it's on unsustainable technology today. And there either needs to be a regression to simplicity or there needs to be a divergence to complexity. But there's no way to get there without developers to take you there. And the current way that developers are funded, the current ambition of those developers is not satisfactory in either direction, in my view. So if the ecosystem wants to survive, it's going to need to figure out its way, its roadmap, its path. And the first major step in getting there is getting funding into the hands of the people who can get you there. And that calms everybody down 
and they realize that no matter which direction it goes, they'll be able to find a niche that has use and utility and an audience for that use and utility and grow within that niche and actually become something quite unique to the ecosystem in space without ever violating its principles. The reason why I bring up things like BitML and Bitcoin's path is that all of these things are vetted with the code is law principle. And it's one of the reasons why Bitcoin was so simple. That's an easy principle to have when your system can't do much. It's a much harder principle to have when your system does a lot. Because some of those things that you're doing may end up not being so good for the network or for others. And so the temptation to reverse things, censor things, uh, the temptation to undo things uh, is much higher. Okay. So similarly, we as an ecosystem, the ETC ecosystem, have to have that philosophical conversation of how do we preserve the code as law philosophy, but uh, also have some more complexity than what Bitcoin is offering enough so that people can build things on ETC that are distinctly different, unique from the things that they would build on Bitcoin, for example, or another ecosystem. Uh, and it's not really an option to go down the uh, F2 road. And their divergence from ETC's principles is only going to accelerate. There's probably going to be a reality uh, as they move to a fully distributed system that pruning occurs, that rent is charged for smart contracts, that the chain gets edited for certain applications and so forth uh, because of the necessity of having billions of users and hundreds of millions of applications and the bloat that comes from that. It's not good enough just to make the system faster. So that technology doesn't work in a code as law world. It's just philosophically incompatible with that. So where do you go? What do you do? Well, I want to have that conversation and I don't want to have that conversation with myself. I'd like to have that conversation with people who feel like they have the total freedom to disagree and have the funding necessary to build anything uh, that they would want to build. And so as a consequence, we, through independent collaboration, can get to a very strong philosophy-based roadmap for 2021 that will create real use and utility and has a real use case and something that an outside marketer could be hired or brought in and clearly know how to sell that clearly know how to grow that and so forth. And ultimately, what is a treasury about? Philosophically speaking, it puts you, the community, in charge. Why? Because the community is ultimately in charge of who gets it, how much they get, and how many people get it. And over time, everything evolves. The treasury system goes to another form, and then to another form, and then to another form. And every time that happens, it gets more inclusive, more decentralized, uh, and also it starts making better and better decisions. The treasury can improve itself. It's self-evolving infrastructure. This is the miracle of cryptocurrencies. They start from some configuration and they have an evolution rate. It can be slow. It can be fast, like ETC is, ETH is fast, for example, Bitcoin is slow, but no one will deny that in all cases, successful cryptocurrencies do evolve through the improvement proposal process. And a treasury as a subcomponent is no different. The treasury gives us in the Cardano ecosystem over $140 million today to play with. And that's coming online systematically and it's evolving, as I mentioned, rapidly. Uh, and, you know, as we grow as an ecosystem, that very easily could turn into a billion dollars. It could turn into $10 billion. It just gets as, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as the cryptocurrency grows. Uh, this is the brilliance of treasury bearing systems. And there is no centralized control there. It's controlled by the community. And similarly, ETC could eventually have this kind of power. And, you know, we're just looking at the proposals for fund one. For our treasury system, uh, there's well over 50, I think, uh, and that's just the beginning. We'll wake up, there's 500. We'll wake up, there's 5,000. We'll wake up, there's 50,000. All curated, tons of discussion around them. And what's cool about a treasury is, and this is my final point, it allows you to set priorities. In a decentralized way. Normally, priorities are set by a CEO, a leader, a committee, a board, they sit down and say, this is the vision. This is the roadmap. This is where we're going to go. 
That doesn't work in a decentralized ecosystem. So you can have volunteers just sit around and do some stuff. And that's great when you have very simple systems. But if you have very complex systems or your systems want to have real use and utility, uh, the ecosystem has to have some priorities to move in that direction. We see that with Linux, for example. Linux is used by billions of people, from my cell phone to many of your cell phones to this very computer. I have Linux DNA everywhere. And there are thousands of corporations that have a vested interest in the evolution and growth of Linux. And that Linux be well supported, not have zero day exploits, and be able to keep up with the ever increasing pace of hardware and new capabilities. Okay, well, you need some decentralized governance structure to set those priorities, set that roadmap, incentivize development, make sure that the system doesn't get co-opted and controlled by a particular entity like a Microsoft or something like that, so that they can gain and do influence or gut the product for competitive reasons. That's why the Linux Foundation was created. And this is our chance to build a system that has that same utility, but it's as decentralized as the underlying currency. And then once you have it, the community can set priorities. How much do we spend on tech? How much do we spend on adoption? How much do we spend on marketing? How much do we spend on infrastructure? How much do we spend on partnership development, developer incentives, these types of things? That is a bespoke conversation to the ETC community. And it would be nice if every single person in Ethereum Classic actually had a voice, as opposed to a bunch of self-appointed leaders having a voice saying, this is what we're going to do, deal with it. And by the way, we're the only people with the money and we maintain the clients right now. So if you disagree with us, there is no support for the product outside of volunteers showing up. And as we've mentioned, too much complexity makes it damn near impossible for volunteers to be effective. Because even if they have the desire to fix the problems, fixing problems takes months in some cases. And who is willing to work for free or very low pay for months to do something and telling them, well, they can profit by buying the token. So they get paid the exact same amount of money as the speculator who does no work. We have a system for that. It's called communism. Didn't work out so well. And that's not how you get systems to work well. Never, ever bet on the altruism of people. Bet on people to be greedy. And build a system that greed results in good outcomes. This is the lesson that all free markets have taught the world. And wherever you can figure out a way uh, to align these things, the systems will evolve in the way you want. For example, if you want solar to take over the world, don't tell people that solar is better for them. Make solar cheaper than coal. And you know what will happen? People will buy it because it's the best option on market and the cheapest option on market. And that's what's happening. And that's why it's slowly taking over the world. Similarly here, we can't bet on altruism. Let's make sure that people can make a living supporting the ecosystem in doing the right thing. And they can make as good or better money doing that than they could make uh, doing other jobs. And then that'll attract great talent, highly specialized talent that can help wrangle complexity where it's decided and make sure that simplicity is preserved where it's needed for the system to be successful. So anyway, I figured I'd make a philosophical video about treasury systems. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, hope it wasn't too long and too rambly. I have a reputation for that. Uh, and I look forward to the debate. We have two ECIPs coming out Wednesday, the 26th. One is for the checkpointing solution. Uh, and then the other is a straw man treasury idea. And both of these are, are meant for discussion with the ecosystem, not final adoption. And our hope is through iteration and discussion that we can converge to uh, a final uh, idea. And in the case of the Treasury, we'll write a smart contract and deploy it. And it's only going to ever be filled with Ether through a hard fork. So it would require adoption and consent to get there. Majority adoption of the client, at the very least. Um, and in the case of the um, ledger checkpointing solution that we have, we're going to do a demo this week and attend the meeting on Thursday for it. Uh, and then uh, next week we'll have the ECIP out and uh, this ECIP is written in a way and uh, the infrastructure is built in a way that we think it's portable. So it's not just the Mantis client. We should be able to figure out a path to implementation for Geth 
and so forth. So the other clients in the ecosystem, we, we should be able to figure out how to get those running with the solution. And again, it's a discussion ECIP. So the point here is not to be a final solution, but rather an intermediate one that allows us to get to that final decision for the community's uh, consideration. Thank you so much for your time. I hope this was helpful and we'll talk soon. Cheers.